Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Wheeler Center. My name is Lily Wilkinson. I'm an author and academic. And today we're here to discuss Charlotte Bronte's Jane Eyre. Joining me this afternoon is Carmel Bird. Carmel Hi. is a novelist who has had a long-term interest in the work of the Bronte sisters. She's written an essay on Jane Eyre, which you can all find by, and write this down, Googling Carmel Bird essay, Jane Eyre. Um, and she also taught VC literature for many years, so she is eminently qualified to chat to us today about Jane Eyre. Please join me in making her welcome. Thanks, Lily. So I thought to get started, um, I would ask, tell us about how you very first encountered Jane Eyre. Yes, well, when I was um, doing VC, it wasn't called VCE, whatever it was, matriculation, um, we studied with a very wonderful teacher, uh, Wuthering Heights, and that was an absolute revelation to me in literature and also in how to study mm -hmm. a work of literature. And then I went on to read Jane Eyre by myself, and that was, and I think it was an even greater revelation. It is a breathtaking piece of writing. So there you go. Definitely. I didn't. I haven't ever studied it, in fact, with um, within a course or anything. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I haven't ever taught it. But I've probably read it in my life probably four times. And uh, it was with great pleasure that I read it this time in order to come here and speak to you. Great. So let's talk about Charlotte Bronte. Uh, to have one lady novelist in a family in the mid-19th century would have, you know, been pretty unusual, but the Bronte sisters had three. It's careless. Um, it is careless. <laughs> um, so tell us a little bit about uh, these, these ladies, and particularly Charlotte, and what do you think made them, um, made them writers? Well, I think it was um, they were brought up in a remote north of England parsonage, where it was, life was difficult, but life was also uh, highly literary. And they had access to works of literature and to books of all kinds. And they lived in a world of their own. And also they, as children, as you probably know, they created worlds of their own. The, their, their world had a name. It was called Angria, A-N-G-R-I-A, which always has fascinated me because they were, in fact, in their writing, they were angry people. If there is one um, emotion that fuels Jane Eyre, it's anger, it's rage. Mm. It's, uh, it's a novel about power and powerlessness and about how one small woman moves from powerlessness to a position of power at the end of the novel. I think that that's really interesting, that, that idea of sort of yeah. rage as being the pivotal point, because mm. I think, you know, for the complete uninitiated to sort of, if you ask sort of the average person on the street who has not read the book or seen one of the films and you ask them, you know, what's this about? They would probably say, oh, you know, it's a love story, something, something. It is a love story. Bonnets, you know. Oh, bonnets. I don't think, I don't think there are very many bonnets. I don't think there are I mean, Speaking of heads, I was going to point out that some people here have probably been to, to Howarth Parsonage and seen the clothes that... The, the sisters wore and will have been struck by the fact that they are very, very, very tiny. Mm. Um, and one of the images that runs through Jane Eyre is the image of Jane uh, as a fairy. And you look at their clothes and you think, yes, well, they could be the clothes of, of fairies. They were very slight and also very short. Mm -hmm. And when I say very short, I can see that you people are really quite tall. And I brought a piece of red ribbon that is 150 centimetres. That's how tall Charlotte Bronte was. Wow. Now, we're not allowed to stand up, I suppose, but you can see that that's much shorter than me and I'm not very tall. So there you go, mm. little little people. So speaking of little people. Mm. Um, and they had bad eyesight too. They did. So this is a gothic novel. It, it is, is full of ghosts and goblins and little green men and fairies and madness and ruined mansions and telepathy and mad ladies in attics. 
what do you think this um, this kind of gothicness as a genre? What does it bring to Jane Eyre? What does it add to the story? Sex. Awesome. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's very, very profoundly sexual mm-hmm. novel, and the you mentioned you know ruined mansions and fairies and birds and angels and things, and uh, they are part of the imagery. And this novel is, it flies along on its imagery, on its use of language, on its rhythm, and on its structure. It has the most lovely structure, Mm. moving in a pilgrimage from one house to another house to another house. And each house has such a key name. Mm. The, The nature of the house is built into its name. Jane's nature is built into her name. She is air. She is light and air. Rochester, rock, you look at any of the names, Fairfax. Well, he's 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 a Fairfax, mm. um, and so not our kind of Fairfax, but his kind of Fairfax. He's got a, a double thing going on in his name. He's not just a rock. He's also fair. Mm. So oh, very he's, he's very. Uh, on the one hand, he is characterised as being dark and black-eyed, and. Um, Dangerous, and even he keeps saying he's ugly. Mm. And Jane is characterised as being tiny and plain, and yet the flip side of each of them is a beautiful fascination, which is lit by nature. Mm -hmm. Constantly there is a juxtaposition within the the text between a, a, a violent and ugly scene such as a a ruined mansion uh, juxtaposed with a serene and beautiful and green and fruitful image Mm. and they move between the two and it moves between the sun and the moon Mm. the moon being um, a signifier of Jane herself and she Mm. in fact listens to the moon the moon speaks to her Mm. Yeah, and but the, the moon is feminine, of course, and the sun is masculine. And there's also, of course, that that you know juxtaposition, which is probably one of the most powerful pieces of imagery in the book, which is fire and ice. Yes, fire and ice. Yes, indeed. What <laughs> what more can we say? But fire and ice. Yeah. Um, and yeah. I think that. Um, in that, particularly in terms of fire and ice, the you know there is the fire um, that is sort of initially brought up in the red room in that moment, ah, yeah. um, and then of course you know Bertha and, and her fire setting tendencies. Yes. Um, but I wanted also to talk about ice because in some ways it is ice that brings Jane and Rochester together. Together, yes. The horse slips on the ice, mm. and this is a moment of fracture, and it is the moment when the novel, as it were, breaks open. Mm. And there is this amazing connection between Rochester and Jane. Mm. And he thinks that she is a fairy from another world. And that she's bewitched his horse. Yes. Um, So another sort of really strong um, sort of contrast or juxtaposition that that is in the text is sort of comes through in, in the idea of religion. And there are sort of these three people that Jane meets that are uh, sort of um, that display religion in three very different ways. There's Brocklehurst, whose faith sort of manifests <gasps> in cruelty and abuse and hypocrisy. Uh, there's Helen Burns, who's so ugly. He, he, he is, he is very so ugly. ugly. He's 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 like a great black marble mm. pillar. Definitely. Uh, there's Helen Burns, who is saintly, um, but also incredibly passive. And I think Jane admires her and loves her greatly, but also sees her as being a bit ineffectual. Um, and then there's St. John Rivers, who is probably in some ways the most balanced, but is also sort of passionless and that jo- uh, Jane feels like she can't ever sort of truly form a connection with. What do you think religion means to Jane? Oh, Jane is a very Christian woman and she is constantly interrogating her own moral position, which is a Christian mm-hmm. position, but she's always testing it. And it, the, the novel ends with a, an, a, an invocation of Christian. Oh, so fat. <laughs> I can't find the bit. Um, oh, this is awful sitting here flicking through a book. Um, but uh, it ends. Um, 
with. Sinjin's last hour, his mind will be... So, so she actually ends by talking about Sinjin, mm. who has gone off to be a missionary without her and so forth. Um, and his last hour, his mind will be unclouded, his heart will be undaunted, his hope will be sure, his faith steadfast. His own words are a pledge of this. My master, he says, has forewarned me. Daily he announces more distinctly. Surely I come quickly and hourly I more eagerly respond. Amen, even so come Lord Jesus. And that, that, so it is a, a the, the, the end of the novel resonates mm. with a Christian statement, mm. even though it has at that moment been um, the, the picture of her happy marriage with Rochester, whose sight has been restored and they have a child mm. and everything it will happily ever after. Because this is a fairy tale. It's mm. a, a gothic fairy tale. Yeah. I... I wonder if um, it sort of strikes me as sort of the choice that Jane has to make towards the end of the novel where she chooses between St. John and Rochester is in some ways like a choice between faith and love because Rochester strikes me as a decidedly unchristian person. He, you know, first of all wants to commit bigamy. Big liar. And yes. he's also a big liar. And then, and he also, um, like, once once Jane discovers his secret, um, she he wants her to live in sin with him. Yes. So he's sort of a very long way away from being a good Christian man. Yeah, and he had made a mistake about her. He hadn't <laughs> quite sussed that she wouldn't do that. <laughs> um, so I want to talk about these these three men that exert power over Jane. Um, there's Brocklehurst, uh, who we mentioned before, uh, Rochester and St. John. What do you think these three men have in common? Oh, heavens, what a question. Um, I haven't ever thought they had anything in common. I think they do. Um, that, that you do? What I, do you think? I think that they all want to control her. Oh, well, that. I mean, yes. <laughs> uh, yes, 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 certainly, certainly, yeah. Um, but, of course, Rochester ends up being, uh, as, as a result of various things, but the fire, mm -hmm. um, completely maimed and damaged and powerless mm. and Jane moves in mm. and takes control to a degree but of course the funny thing is that she can only take that control because she has inherited money yeah so the equality that comes to her and Rochester is not a very romantic solution, is it? It's no. not like a romance novel there. Yeah. No. no, and I wanted to talk about that because it's something that's mm. always struck me. And I just want to go back and, and talk about the... We'll come back to that. Mm. Um, I wanted to talk about the reception of the book when it was published. Um, I've got a couple of quotes from contemporary reviews. Uh, Matthew Arnold wrote, Miss Bronte has written a hideous, undelightful, convulsed, constricted novel, one of the most utterly disagreeable books I've ever read, because the writer's mind contains nothing but hunger, rebellion and rage, and therefore that is all she can, in fact, put in her book. Call him Mr Brocklehurst. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then somebody from the Quarterly Review wrote that Jane, Jane Eyre demonstrates a tone of mind and thought which has overthrown authority and violated every code, human and divine. And that review went on to say that the book could not possibly have been written by a woman because... The character of Jane is so unseemly and unladylike and has so many inappropriate feelings uh, that a woman could not possibly have written something so ungenteel. Mm. So what was it about this book that made it so radical and kind of polarising when it was published? Oh, well, it uh, challenges gender, class. Uh, it challenges Christianity because mm. Christianity in River's form and in Brocklehurst's form is overthrown mm. by the text. It is a very shocking novel in its ideas. Mm. It, it actually still is. Um, but I like to return to its magic mm. and the absolutely compelling nature of the narrative. Mm. And it's in the writing. It's deep within the language and the structure of the book. Mm. So you still think it's a radical text? Yes, it is radical. Um, it's very much bursting out of its own time. Mm. And it's, it's dazzling. And it, it, it's on fire. Mm. And it still is on fire. Mm. 
And I think that the students who are here today to talk about it and think about it will all have been captivated by the way the story rushes on. Mm, definitely. Are you guys feeling captivated? You look captivated. <laughs> um, so I wanted to talk about some of... I want to talk about sort of the, the role of women and the role of domesticity in this whole thing about the book being very much about the position of women in society. And the other women that we come across at, at Thornfield um, are sort of this... Uh, I don't know, kind of desperate collection of women. There's poor alcoholic Grace Poole. There's, you know, sort of husband hunting Miss Ingram. There's steadfast Mrs. Fairfax. And then there's, of course, Bertha. And I feel like these women are all in some, in different ways, but they're all sort of suffocating in these domestic prisons. And I wonder what hope do we have that Jane isn't going to end up like them? She's never going to end up like them. She has closed her story mm -hmm in serenity mm -hmm. and in with I think a declaration of faith and hope mm -hmm. and she will prevail in that way until she dies. Mm -hmm. um, because I also was really struck by the way that um, sort of in order for them to be together she has to be raised up financially and he has, um, to, be and he has to be brought down, down physically. Um, yeah. and, and that so she ends up um, really still in servitude to him in some ways because she will have to look after him for the rest of his life. She likes that. <laughs> and they are presented as being uh, in a contract mm -hmm. and it seems to be a decent contract. Mm -hmm. He is not asking too much of her. Mm -hmm. She is not giving too much of herself. Mm -hmm. Do you think that the book um, punishes them for the kind of the, the wildness of their love before and the sort of the, the intense sexuality of their love? Do you think that, no. that they are punished by that? No, I don't think so. They produce a firstborn. We only ever hear about one child, mm -hmm. but that suggests that there might be going to be more. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is throughout the, the novel, there is a hideous image of a child in her dreams that rolls off and, and mm. falls away. It's, it's, it's a shocking image mm. of a, a child and that plays against the, the, it's not really an image, it's just a little statement of the fact that there is a firstborn mm. but it is a, is a Christ-like mm. child mm. image at the end. Um, Alright, so let's talk about Rochester um, because he certainly, you know, he's very sexy. Um, but is he a nice guy? I'm not convinced by Rochester. No, I don't think he's... He was... No, I can't see him. But, but the, what you have to remember, though, is that he recognises Jane's worth. Mm -hmm. He misunderstands mm -hmm. and mm. thinks that she might be his mistress. Because <laughs> uh, he's not... hasn't quite grasped everything. Mm. But uh, he has got the perception of her moral, physical, emotional goodness. Mm -hmm. And she, I think, has given him that, mm. perhaps, by, yep. by the end. So you think that he redeems himself? Hmm, it's hard, isn't it? We're, we we're struggling. <laughs> we're struggling here. Yeah. Um, so what do you think are the, the sort of key moments or scenes in the book that really stand out for you? Oh, I want to talk about chapter 23, which is um, the almost the dead centre of the book. Mm -hmm. And I made a couple of notes um, on it that I'd like to talk about because this is, after all, a love story. And chapter 23 um, has got the kiss the first kiss mm -hmm. in it and that is a you know a high point of the book love is central to the plot there are many other concerns of course which we have spoken of here we ought to talk about slavery mm -hmm. probably um, but I, I want to draw attention to the love story page 286 in my book right in the center of the narrative it foregrounds the love story 
It's the chapter, as I said, where he kisses her and where he proposes marriage. This whole chapter deserves your very closest attention. It's a wonderful example of Charlotte Bronte's techniques, the devices whereby she works her magic, whereby she delivers her meaning to her reader. She works with mood, with language, with image, motif, foreshadowing, juxtaposition, and she places the drama at the heart of Jane's story within a scene of brightness and natural beauty. It's Midsummer Eve, Adele has been picking strawberries, Jane is in the orchard. <laughs> she thinks of it as being like Eden, this is paradise. And then she gets a whiff of something in the air and it's his cigar. Now, I mean, you can take a Freudian reading of, of this novel if you will. Um, but this is the sweet center of the story. The chapter ends with a thunderstorm, an incredible thunderstorm, where the chestnut tree is split. And this is like a foreshadowing of the, the splitting of Rochester. Now, your job as a VCE student is to be alert to how these things are done. Notice how the language and the imagery are building the tension, not only of this scene, but of the novel as a whole. On the first page of this chapter, the moon has not yet risen. The world is still a blaze of red and purple. Red and purple ripples through the novel. Um, now the moon is one of the recurring images and it actually, as I said, speaks to her. Um, and it's so she sees Rochester then into the orchard. And what he does is, goodness gracious me, he plucks a ripe cherry. Now, this is a very clear physical signifier of sex, among other um, signifiers. The moth is another one. A moth appears, and Rochester quietly invites Jane to examine the moth. Um, and now he refers to the West Indian appearance of the moth. And as whenever through the novel the West Indies is invoked, um, you are looking at another side of the world. Um, the, you are being introduced to the concept of slavery, although slavery is never actually addressed, mm -hmm. but England, beautiful England, midsummer is one thing a binary opposite is the West Indies, which is savage and exotic and dark and colorful and red and purple and so on and so forth. And uh, Jane is, 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 in one sense, the English pearl, and Bertha is the, the, the dark, fiery, crazy other side of Jane. Anyway, you get all that coming in in this particular chapter, I won't go on and on um, here, but slavery and colonialism is definitely invoked at this point. And then Jane is distracted by a ladybird, a ladybird which will fly away home. And the novel is a novel about finding home and that image at the end of the, the broken man with his eyesight coming back and the, the good wife and the little child. It is a serene image at a place called Ferndine, which is, of course, a beautiful um, name of, of somewhere green and lush and secretive too. And uh, anyway, at one point in chapter 23, he suddenly takes her in his arms and kisses her, and it, it never ceases to come as a shock to me. I mean, I know I've been prepared for it with the, the, the red and the purple and the, the cherry and the moth and everything's happening, but then he, he kisses her. And it's a, it's a huge shock mm. to the reader when he does that. And, and strangely enough, it doesn't seem to be quite as shocking to her as it is to me. Mm. Anyway, it's a love story. Never forget, it's a love story. Mm. It's a beautiful yeah. scene. Yeah. Um, excellent, thank you. Are there any other kind of uh, sort of moments or scenes that you think are sort of worthy of that kind of close analysis? I mean, oh, apart many, from all of many, it, many apart from all of them. <laughs> um, 
Well, there's, of course, the, uh, the Red Room. You can't go past the Red Room. The, the Red Room is the most wonderful introduction mm. to a novel of love and passion and power and powerlessness and, and drama and, and whatever. Mm. And such a lovely sort of foreshadowing of those sort of great gothic elements yes. of the ghost and the... Yes, mm. yes, she nailed it mm. in the Red Room. Charlotte Bronte nailed it. I think. Mm. Excellent. All right. Well, we might throw open to the audience because there are an awful lot of you and I'm sure you are all burning with questions. Um, so raise your hand and we've got two awesome helpers on the sides who will pass your microphone. So wait till you have the microphone before you start to ask your question. I wonder what they do think of St. John Rivers. Has anyone got an opinion on St. John Rivers? Be I'm, I'm quite fascinated by St. John. I suppose as Jane is the other side of Bertha, St. John is He's the other, the side, other of side of Rochester. Of Rochester. Do you like thinking about characters in that way? That that one whole character like St. John and a whole character like Rochester are actually aspects of each other. Mm. Mirror mm. images. Of course, there are lots of mirrors in the story mm. too. A very big theme. Mm. All right, well, just stick your hand up if you do come up with something. There's oh, there we hand. go. Well Good. done. Good. What do you think in the end, Carmel, um, about the feminism in Jane Eyre? That is, I mean, it was, it was immensely radical. We, we, we heard the quotes that you gave us, um, contemporary, opinion, uh, con contemporary opinions, and <clears throat> it, it's very evident what a, what a shock this was to the civilised world to have all of this um, stuff that even Freud had w wasn't around to, to bear, um, stripped open um, in Jane Eyre. But then at the end, she marries. Reader, I married him. Reader, I, yes, reader, I married him. Yeah, exactly. Well, feminists are allowed to marry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank goodness. <laughs> but it is one of the great feminist texts of all time. Would anyone challenge that? I, 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 I don't think so. Um, Jane Eyre is an emblem of the powerless female enclosed in the shocking, shocking red room who by dint of her own perseverance as a woman uh, yeah, thank you, yes. And, and enormous courage breaks out of the patriarchal, colonial red room. Mm. And I think that it's a lot to do with choice as well, that, you know, she's strong enough to leave him when, mm. you know, she discovers he's, you know, being kind of dreadful. Um, and then it is her choice to return to him. Um, you know, she is not asked, she is not pressured to. That is her decision and she gets to do it as an independent woman. Yes, um, she did have to inherit the mm, money. Yes, she which is kind of She had to annoying. inherit the money. Mm. Whereas the Brontes themselves made their money by writing fiction. Mm. And that is a fabulous um, feminist act. Mm. And women, of course, women with books... We, women with pens were scary to the society of the time. Scary. Mm, powerful and independent. Mm. And yet Charlotte Bronte, uh, you know, in some ways married the St. John of her own life. The, the man she married was a, was a reverend, I think. Um, oh, yes. And that she said for, him for always that she never loved him. Yes, I know. Well, she was in love with Constantin Hager, mm. who was her tutor mm -hmm. in Germany. And he was a married man. Couldn't do it. Scandalous. Mm. So, so yeah, she ended up. Did someone want to say something? It was Brussels, not Germany. Oh, Brussels. sorry. Oh, thank you. No, no. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So yeah, in some ways, um, yeah, I wonder if Charlotte was not quite as brave as Jane, um, because she did marry the the one that she didn't love, and died during pregnancy. Mm. So sad. Very. So sad. Any other questions, thoughts, comments? There's one in there. Excellent. Do I have to stand up? 
No. Okay. Um, I was just going to ask, um, we were talking about um, today how Jane Eyre sort of easily forgives everyone and she's got quite a caring nature. I was wondering whether in essay form or even in our um, exam, whether that's worth talking about? Like whether that's a common theme or concept that we should address um, when writing about Jane Eyre, whether we should address. What's the concept? Forgiveness. Uh, yeah, her forgiving. F forgiveness. Yeah. Who does she forgive? Mr. Oh, Rochester. Everybody. Rochester, but also uh, her aunt. Yeah, Mrs. Uh, who, Reed. You know, on her, oh, Mrs. Right. Reed on her yeah. deathbed, and yeah. who, you know, is probably not really deserving of her forgiveness. Shocking. Yeah. Shocking woman. Mm. What she did to Jane. Mm. Whew. Um, so what does it say about Jane that she's so forgiving? Well, she's very Christian. Mm. It, it is a, um, a Christian trait mm. to forgive. And yet she doesn't, it takes her a long time to forgive Mrs. Reed that, you know, she, mm. she's not very Christian to Mrs. Reed when she's young, you know, when she it tells her oh, how much she dislikes poor her. Poor child. And, yeah, no, no. Oh, it, it, I'm not mm. saying that yeah. it's, it's a bad mm. thing, but it, it isn't, you know, Christian. Um, and that I suppose she does need to uh, experience some degree of independence before she's able to forgive her. As VCE literature students, your task really is to examine the text for the techniques that the author is using in order to deliver the story to you. Now, what you need to look for, therefore, in response to your question, are images, language, structures, foreshadowings and so forth, which deliver to you the idea of Jane's forgiveness. It's certainly there, mm. and it is an aspect of her character, of her morality, of her Christian nature. Therefore, it's not unimportant, but there are, there are bigger things, I, th I think, to look at. The Gothic nature of the story is so exciting and, and so rich in material for you to write about. Look at that. Gothic love story. Mm. And in some ways a ghost story. For sure. Oh, yes. And such mysterious things happening, like where Jane hears Rochester calling mm. out. That's telepathy. Mm. There's a hand. Is there a hand there? Yes. Someone waving. Drowning. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Um, I just wanted to ask what you think the main message of the novel is and what does Charlotte want the reader to grasp? Wow. There's the question. Okay. It's, a, it's a novel about power and powerlessness and it's demonstrating how grit and that, that's a bit dull, but grit and determination and perseverance and honesty and goodness will, in the end, be rewarded with power. Mm. And I think that it's also, it is, it is goodness, but it's, it is also about, um, I don't know, it's sort of self-respect in a lot of ways. Oh, she's big on self-respect. Because there she are lots of... She tells him that, yeah. that she respects herself. Mm. I can't exactly quote mm. um, what she says, but there is a point where she... Mm. When she's turning him down... Mm. And that's what's so great about Jane is that she mm. is always willing to stand up for herself. She's always willing to, you know, to engage in those, you know, fabulous kind of tussles that she has with Rochester mm. when Rochester just tries to sort of stamp her down and she won't go down. And I think that that requires a certain amount of, it's not arrogance, but it's self-respect. Um, oh, yes. That I think sort of is more than just being good because uh, it's being good to yourself as well as being, you know, good to everybody around you. Yes. Whereas, yeah. you know, the, the Helen Burns kind of character is perhaps seen as more of like a, like making all of those sacrifices and being selfless. Oh, come on. Poor old Helen had typhus. She did. Yeah. Um, but she sort of she just takes everything that she's given, um, mm, whereas mm. Jane sort of d has yeah, that. Well, she's the rebel. Jane, yeah. Jane is the other side of Helen. Mm. You know, Jane is the rebel, and I guess in answer to your question also is that it can be good to rebel. 
Mm. And the Brontes were rebels, they were all rebels, and society recognised that, and of course with these quotes from the newspapers, um, punished them for it. Mm. Absolutely. Yep, up the back. Hi, um, I was just wondering, I heard something about how Jane had, I mean Charlotte Bronte had used, sorry, she kind of made the whole incorporating how Jane got inherited the money as kind of a cheat on how to finish the novel because she didn't know what else to do. I was wondering what your thoughts are on that. Well, it's a bit unkind to novelists <laughs> to, to say that they had to work out how to finish the novel and therefore did this, that and the other. That um, legacy is coming all the way through. You will find it when you read very, you have to read the book about three times, I'm sorry, and it's 500 and something pages. Um, in order to be alert to things like that legacy, which is seeded into the novel, it doesn't just pop up at the end. It appears, but it's been foreshadowed. Um, so it sounds, it's, a bit, it's a bit facile of a critic, I think, mm -hmm to say that, oh, she just had to... I'm not saying you are the critic, I'm saying you're quoting a critic, and fair enough, because people do say this. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think it's built in. Yeah, and I think it's also built into the the genre of it as well, because the you know in a in a more realistic novel, that sort of series of coincidences mm. that leads her to inheriting all of the money mm. could be seen as being a bit of a, a long bow. Yes, um, but uh, as Lily says, this is a genre novel mm. too. It isn't realistic. Mm. The moon probably doesn't talk to anybody. Probably not. Know. But um, <laughs> telepathy might exist. Mm. Uh, but the the fortune that comes at the end is part of the genre, mm. and it, it's not really. I don't. I don't see it as a cop out. Do you read Dickens? Dickens is marvelous mm. on coincidence as well, and the, this novel is is full of Jane Eyre is is full of coincidence. One, one coincidence that sometimes gives me pause for thought is the fact that she ended up at Moore House where St. John Rivers and his sisters were and they turned out to be her relatives. Uh, it's hard to bring that off in fiction. Mm. Things like that do actually happen in life. Mm. And you know, uh, the English aristocracy, mm. there is some inbreeding going on there. So. <laughs> but it, just because something happens in life doesn't mean you have made it come true in fiction. I, I sometimes do see that coincidence as a bit of a worry to me. But then I, the, the language, the imagery, the, the, the gothic nature, the genre, mm. the love story takes me on and I, I say, OK, I'll, I can take it. Mm. And yes. everything in the book, you know, mm. all of the emotion and the description is so heightened and so dramatic yes. and um, that, yeah, it sort of makes all of that sort of fit in a little more, I think. I think you're right, yes. Mm. But good question. It was a good question. Mm. Who else has a good question? Yep. Um, I was just wondering, the scene with Brocklehurst and when he humiliates Jane, I was wondering if you thought that foreshadowed any of her relationships with other men in the book and how, like, they can humiliate I don't know that it's a foreshadowing of any other oppression from other men, but it is a terrific warning to her about um, how cruel the world can be. And uh, it, it's an incredibly powerful image of him as a great black pillar, so threatening. Mm. But I don't see... Yeah, I wonder if sort of up until that point Jane has sort of wanted to be loved and that's been her sort of primary mm -hmm. goal. I mean, she says to Mrs Reed, you know, if only you'd let me love you. Um, and well, sort that's of, the opposite of what you just said, though. You said she wants to be loved. Yes, and she, well, says, and she wants, to, she wants yes, to be she wants in a loving in love. relationship. Yes. Mm. Whereas I think probably from that point on what she seeks is independence. Yes. So perhaps she then learns that maybe people are too cruel. Mm. Um, and Although she does have Miss Temple and... Oh, Miss, Miss Temple is a, a beautiful foil mm. to Mr Brocklehurst, but Mr Brocklehurst 
holds the purse strings he and everything. Yeah, he's a bad man. But and she gets you know, away. She does, and he's a terrible hypocrite too. Well, hypocrisy is in him. It's in Rochester. Yep. Uh, who else is oh, Mrs. Reed is mm -hmm. hypocritical. John Reed, because John Reed comes to a terribly bad mm -hmm. end. Um, I'm not fond of the character of St. John Rivers myself. Why not? He is, is, he has a bit of Brocklehurst, of course, in him, hasn't he? Um, in a different way, mm. he he is more of a passive aggressive. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Not, as, not quite as straightforward as Mr. Brocklehurst. Mm. Lovely name, Brocklehurst. It is. Yes. <laughs> and Rivers, St. John Rivers is peaceful. Mm. Holy. Um, holy. Mm. Yes, St. John. Mm. The Baptist. Yes. <laughs> Any other questions? Yep, down the front here. How consciously... Carmel and both of you, um, do you think that Charlotte was working with the dramatic archetypal material in this book? Look, I think she was very conscious. What do you think? I think yeah. she knew what she was doing. Yeah. I think to a great extent, I, I think it probably surged up and then got identified and then got incorporated. Does, yes. that, does that make sense? Yeah. That makes perfect sense. And she was so tuned in to emotion and to nature and to imagery that she had a, a great genius for incorporating her, her imagery to, to deliver the emotion. Mm. I think she was a very, very clever girl. Yeah, and I think that's really true and I think that that's something that all writers recognise that so much of storytelling is very instinctive and then once you've done it you can kind of recognise the, the sort of motifs that you are unconsciously putting in there and then, you know, obviously make more of them. Um, and you see the, the, the Brocklehurst name and the Rochester name, they, they're witty. Mm. There's, there's quite a lot of witty stuff in there. And oh, like, look, every one of the names, mm. just yes. about every one of the names, and they, of course, have to be absolutely conscious, don't they? Mm. They do, they do. And she even, there are not a lot of jokes in it, but there is a joke where um, Rochester says to her that he's made uh, contact with people in Ireland where she could go and be a governess. And the, the name of the place is, oh, what are they? I wrote, I wrote it down. Um, because it, it, it sticks out as a, a joke. And, and Jane doesn't get the joke, but um, Rochester does, because he made it up. And of course, um, <laughs> and Charlotte, Charlotte Bronte, she gets the joke too. It's. Mrs. Dionysus oh, that's right. o Gall of Bitternut Lodge. <laughs> so, yes, Mrs. Dionysus o Gall of Bitternut Lodge. So, yes, she knew a lot. Mm. And the, the fact that they made up those men's names under which to write, mm. Cara Ellis and Acton Bell, that's clever and witty and daring, and they were amazing girls. Mm. Yeah. Well, you, re you remember about where the, the bell comes from. Um, it's it's um, uh, the the minister, Jane Married. Yes. It's part of his name. Part of his name. That's right. Yes. So yes. Mm. Yes. And, you know, so it's it, all some sort of secret hidden side of the, of the clergy. And the, and the yes. Oh, yes. And this um, edition that I've been working from, which is the Penguin Classic with the, the black cover and lots and lots and lots of notes, is absolutely marvellous for its references um, explaining where Charlotte took um, many of her inspirations from the people. I mean, the Earl of Rochester was a rake a famous rake, uh, and so she's taken that name. I mean, of course, it is also a terrific name to describe him, so we've got the two things happening there. Um, but I, I commend this edition to you as students, if you can get hold of that. It's full of 
this kind of information about where little secret things are seeded into the text. Mm. All right. Well, unfortunately, that's all we have time for is this it? afternoon. Yes, it is. Mm. Um, so please join me in thanking Carmel. Uh, and the diehard Bronte fans in the audience can join me again in two weeks when we'll be talking about Wuthering Heights. Oh, lucky things. Yes. <laughs> Thanks a lot, everyone. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.